T-G-I-F. Thank God it's Friday, right? Uh, if you saw that outside, you're like, oh, the sermon's called TGIF. It's not Friday. So if you thought it stood for that, that's just ridiculous. But uh, the point is, it's back to school. Uh, this is spinning back up for us. And so back to school really kind of affects everything and everywhere. I just remember walking into the store and being like, why is it so busy? Oh, back to school. Uh, I remember uh, getting traffic. And as I'm going to the traffic, I'm like, why does traffic, why is it so terrible? Oh, back to school. Uh, you're heading home, back to school. For many of us who have uh, students or students who we have with us today, you're going to meet the teacher events. You're going to back to school shopping. Uh, but the idea is that we all have busy times in our life. We're entering a season for many of us where we are wearing more hats. We have more jobs to do. We have more responsibilities. And so for some of us, it's, it's even just um, people of all ages are going back to college. Their semesters are starting. I am losing so many wonderful, wonderful, volunteers who I'm so sad to see go, but young adults that are going on to great things in college. Uh, but we've all had this time in our life. We all have a time in our life where we have a lot going on, a lot of responsibilities, and the last thing we want on any of these things is an F on our report card, right? You get an F on your report card, they write it too. When teachers give you an F, they write it in red pen, which I think is a little, it's a little much, right? And then they'll circle it and put like an F minus. Why does it have to have a minus next to it? Can't it just be an F? And so with the last thing we want is failure. And we're conditioned in, from our young age to not fail, right? You come home with an F on your report card, and you better have a last will and testament, right? Like it's, it's it. You don't want that. It's not failure is not an option, right? So you go back there and you work harder till you don't have that F anymore. That's what we learn in life. And so I remember I had a time in my life where it was extremely busy. I was in my mid-20s. I was a department head uh, for this company. And uh, one day my boss says, hey, Bryce, let me talk to you for a second. My boss was the CEO of the company, so you, you, never, you never want that. Especially as like a young 25-year-old kid, I'm like, what I do wrong? So I sit in his office. He says, Bryce, you've been doing, you've been doing a good job. You're the first one here. Your projects are looking great. But here's what I need. You're salaried, like you're a manager. I need you to stay late just because. I need you to get involved in other people's projects. I just really, Bryce, what I need is I need, I need more from you. I said, all right. Yes, sir. Aye, aye, captain. So I stayed late. And I worked late, and then I left from work, and I went straight to church because I was an intern for the youth group at the time of a different church. And as I went there, I got in kind of late, and uh, I had some internship duties to do, and my boss there, who was a youth pastor, he said, Bryce, can I talk to you for a second? I said, yes, sir. And he said, hey, do you want to make this a career? I was like, yeah, that, that's why I'm going to seminary. That's why I'm doing this. I'm hoping it pays off big, right, for my family. This is my future, my calling. It's everything. And he's like, all right. Well, you're doing great. He goes, but if we could just give you a little bit more responsibility, kind of give you a few more roles around the church, that would really show the powers that be that maybe we, we should hire you. Maybe there's a place here for you. So if you, would just, if you would just invest a little bit more. Really, Bryce, what I need is I need just a little bit more from you. I said, yes, sir. Aye, aye, captain. And I got home late. And when I got home on these nights, my kids were already in bed. Um, and so I, I left before they're awake. I get home after they're asleep. And uh, as I get home, my wife says, hey, uh, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, <laughs> yes, ma'am. She says, hey, there's, there's weeds around the house. Like stuff is broken. The faucet's leaking. Your kids didn't even see you today. We need more from you. We need more from you. I said, yes, ma'am. Aye, aye, Captain, we'll do it. And as I sat in the tension, this was faith, family, calling. This was job. Which one of these can fail? Which one of these can I slack on? Which one can I let go of? Because all of them want more of me, and there's only so much of me to go around. And I can't afford to fail my family. That can't happen. I can't afford to fail my job. That's money on the table. We were single income home. I had two little kids. Like, we needed to figure this out. And I couldn't, I couldn't fail my faith, my job, my, my calling, because I felt like that's my vision. That's my future. That's why I'm going to college. That's, that's, so I'm hoping that this pays off so I can spend more time with my kids in the future, have a good, right? So I went into the uh, workshop of my soul, and I did some research in the back cave. And... I looked at my life and I said, you know what, this whole like sleep thing we do, 
seems a bit excessive, you know? They're like, oh, you should get eight hours. And some are like, eight hours, you should get 10. And some are like, I think 12 is good. I'm like, what are you sleeping half your life away? We got work to do. If your doctor's like, get more sleep, you're like, I don't mean to laugh. I'm so sorry. Um, but I thought, you know what, this, this can give a little. So I found something on sleep research called the Everyman Sleep Cycle. This is where you sleep for three hours at night, and then you take three 10-minute naps. Now, the reality is most research said four hours, but I think one said three. And I was like, let's go with that. It's, the, it's clearly the best one. The, less sleep, the least sleep, that's the best option. So I'd go to bed at 12. I'd wake up at 3 a.m. I would take a nap before work. Uh, during my lunch break, and either before I headed home or right once I got home. And so I did this, and I caught up on work. I caught up on seminary. I caught up in things around the church. I caught up at home. I even caught up on a few video games, I'll be honest. And I thought, man, I cracked it. We did it. And I was talking to people like, here's how I turned my life around. Have you heard of the Everman Sleep Cycle? Have you done sleep? This sleep thing, it's overrated. Give it a shot. You should do it. They're like, Bryce, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, my eye doesn't mean to twitch, but it's great. Just give me more coffee. And despite trying as hard as I could, I, I learned this lesson, right, I thought. And I developed this prayer. Lord, broaden my shoulders so I can carry more. Lord, strengthen my legs to march on. Stiffen my back. Give me a stiff upper lip. Sounds like a good prayer, right? Sounds like some of you could use that prayer today. You're like, yeah, that's a prayer of a faithful man right there. But here's what I was really praying I prayed, Lord, spread me so paper thin that I can cover everything in my life. Spread me so thin so that there's enough of me to go around. Because what can fail? Not family, not job, not calling. My mental health, my well-being, sure. Those are expendable. My sleep, don't need it anyways. And so as I lived my life this way, I thought I learned how to do it all, how to have it all. I cracked the code. I should run a podcast. Have you checked out my blog? And then, in the worst season of my life, I would get fired from a church job. Uh, and the church was like, and you're excommunicated. We don't see you around here anymore. Uh, my wife would leave me. We would get a divorce. I would be separated from my children. I was left homeless with no place to go. I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from. I didn't know where my next place to be could, could find shelter. I didn't know where to go. And so... As much as I like to deflect and be mad at everyone around, well, it's a church, well, it's my ex-wife, well, it's this, the reality is the person I was the most angry at was me. And in my life, I was like, God, why couldn't I just be more, right? Why couldn't I just be more? Why wasn't I enough? Teach me how to be more, God. And so I would go from church to church. Anytime church was open, it was a great place to find shelter. And I would go to these churches. I'd check these churches out. And we would sing these songs in church about dry bones. There's a song called Rattle. And these dry bones are going to walk again. In fact, the song we just sang, it's your breath in our lungs. Our, our, our hearts will cry out. These bones will sing, great are you, Lord. And as I heard these songs, they made me angry. They made me unreasonably upset. And the reason why is because I knew where these songs came from. I knew what part of scripture they were alluding to. There's a section of your Bible, which is a whole section of known as the prophets. And for people who have been in church for a long time, this part of their Bible is really well unread. Um, we don't go there. The prophets are kind of dusty. They're kind of weird. They're poetic. Uh, and it's the same story over and over and over with these prophets. Now, for those of you who don't know, let me explain what a prophet is. A prophet of God is someone who has a job to preach to the people of Israel to a certain time, to turn from their wicked ways, honor God, and avoid destruction that was heading their way. And so that was their calling. That was their job. And let me tell you, they were not successful. The people did not turn from their wicked ways. They did not honor God, and they did not avoid their own destruction. But this job for these prophets wasn't just a job. It was a calling tied up with their faith. It was family. It was neighbors. It was friends. These were the people they were preaching to. They didn't work a nine to five, clock in, clock out. This was everything. What are you currently in right now? Does it feel like calling? Does it feel like family? Does it feel like your life itself is on the line with these important roles that they're too important to fail? And so these prophets, they... They preached 
to these people, on and on and on, faith, family, calling, this was everything to them. And uh, Ezekiel is an interesting one, because Ezekiel is right on the event horizon. Generations of prophets before him had warned people, and generations would come after him, but Ezekiel's kind of right there in the middle, and everything that the doomsday prophecies, everything that they were, they were preaching against, they, they all happened under his watch. And Ezekiel, as this happened, he watched a battle fought, People died, were carried off to slavery, and there was failure. Failure. He failed in faith, family, calling. He failed his friends, his neighbors. And so Ezekiel goes to bed. He goes to sleep. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14, we're going to read real quick. Ezekiel chapter 37, it says, The hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. Now, when he says that he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, he's saying, I was dreaming. This was a vision. Here's the dream I had. God brought me out in spirit. And in the spirit, he brought me out to a valley. And, it, and, and uh, he set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He spent some time in these bones. Bones that were very dry. I like some translations say, and behold, the bones are very dry. It seems more dramatic that way. As he looked at these bones, these weren't just movie prop bones. These weren't just fake Halloween decorations. He knew these bones by name. These bones were his friends, his family, his neighbors. These bones also were a very real symbol of his failure and the loss that he was currently in. And so God asks Ezekiel a question. He says, son of man, can these bones live? Son of man, Ezekiel, can these bones, can they live again? Now, Ezekiel, if you start at the beginning, chapter one, you read Ezekiel. Ezekiel is one of the craziest prophets of God. He's on fire. He will do anything for God. In fact, there's one where God's like, eat uh, food roasted over poop to show people the filth that they're eating. And Ezekiel's like, on it. And I'm like, I would not, I wouldn't. Like student ministry can do some weird stuff. I'm not doing that right? He's like, stage a battle with little army like figures, and I'm like, I'd do that. That sounds fun. But Ezekiel would do this crazy stuff for God, and you think Ezekiel's response would be, son of man, can these bones live again? You think he'd say, yes, Lord, absolutely, amen, for you are before all things, over all things, all things are unto you. You're the alpha, the omega, the creator. With one word, you can speak, and these bones will spring up. But that's not what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel can only bring himself this great man of faith, this prophet of God, he can only bring himself to say, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Sovereign Lord, you, you alone know. Has your prayer life been there? Have you been there? Have you prayed with someone over the job, the health, the family member, loss? And, and as you prayed, all things are possible, right? It's going to happen. God's got you. And then they die. The job is lost. The house is lost. The relationship falls apart. And then someone else says, hey, will you pray with me? And all you can bring yourself to say in that prayer is, Lord, you know what you're going to do. God, you know what you're going to do. Why, why, why do you want me to pray? Sovereign Lord, you, you alone know. Can these bones live again? If you want them to, God, why are you asking me? Right? Has your prayer life been there? In the midst of failure, after a failure, through a failure. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you. You will come to life and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. One of these songs is called Rattle, right? And this is where the song comes from. The bones began to rattle. And bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, tendons and flesh appeared on them. So he says, the bones started to move, and they were covered with skin. Now he's got a face to the names. Now as he looks at the cadavers that are still dead around him, he says, I knew that man. I knew that boy. I, I invited him to call. I, I hung out with him. I just begged him. He wouldn't... I knew these people. And there's a problem. They're not breathing. They have no breath in them. And skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. 
Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Have you been there in your life? Have you had failure? Have you had setback? Have you had heartache? Have you said, I'm cut off. There is no hope. My bones are exceedingly dry. I've got nothing left to give, God. And God says, don't you, don't you hear what I say to you? This is what the sovereign Lord said. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. Then, my people, you know that I am the Lord. The, the promise, the relationship, the prosperity, the goodness in your life that you're chasing, the success that you so desperately need. God says, listen, I, it's going to be there. It's going to come. I'm going to put breath in you. I'm going to raise you out of your graves. And then you will know. That I, the Lord, have spoken, that I have done it, declares the Lord. If you're hearing this for the first time, it can be really exciting. Like, let's do it. I want to I go, like, give a homeless man food. I want to get involved in, in a ministry. I want to serve in students. I want to do something great for God. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's great. We wrote songs about it. We sing those songs. We love those songs. But then Ezekiel woke up. Then Ezekiel woke up. It was, a, it was a dream. It wasn't real. So Ezekiel gets out of his bed. He goes out to the valley and behold, the bones are exceedingly dry. Do you feel like that in church sometimes? You step in, you sit, you get a good word, you go to a Bible study, you pray with someone, and you feel excited. You feel like, yeah, God's going to do it. It's going to be great. And then you return home, and behold, the bones are exceedingly dry. Where's your God now? So we have in our life failure. And when you fail, you have so many people who come around you and they say, listen, you just did it wrong. You prayed wrong. You didn't have enough faith. If only you had listened to this podcast, if only you had gone to church more, if only you had served here, if only you read the Bible more, if only you prayed more, then, then God's heart would have been turned by your righteousness. Then God's heart would have softened towards you. That's why he's not hearing your prayers. That's why it's not working. You just need to be a better Christian. Or, or, or on the flip side, people say, I got it all figured out. If only you would have listened to me. Have you heard of the Everman Sleep Cycle? And so we come along, people fail, or we say, didn't you know? Didn't you know that would fail? Why did you even try? Why did you even do it in the first place? If I was with those prophets, if I was in their position, I would have, I would have felt like this. Loud and clear, God heard you. I was wrong. I stepped out and did something for me. It was foolish. Shouldn't have done it, God. I learned my lesson. I'm done. I'm washed up. I'll never do it again, ever. It's not that these jobs were too important to fail. It's not that these jobs were too important to fail. Listen, these jobs, this calling, what God has for you is too important to stop at failure. It's too important to give up. Don't stop being a dad. Don't stop being a mom. Don't stop being a student. Don't stop being a husband. Don't stop being a wife. Don't stop being a grandparent. Don't stop being a family. Stay involved. These jobs are not too important to fail. They're too important to stop at failure. And so everyone, everyone lives their life this way. And they think about how much God has for them in their lives. How much God calls them to. And you're like, I can't do it. It's not enough. Everyone wants to be David killing Goliath. 
and you have something in your life, like it's a giant, we're gonna slay it. I'm that little boy, there's that giant, God's got me, we're gonna do it. David and Goliath, here we go. Everyone wants to be David and Goliath. But there's three people in the Bible named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were led to a fiery furnace. And we remember their words, those of us who have read the story. It says when, when the king brought them to the furnace because they wouldn't bow to the world. They wouldn't bow to wickedness. They wouldn't bow to the things of this earth. He said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to throw you in. They said, our God will surely save us from this fire, O king. But then he said, even if he doesn't, we will not bow to you you are God or the things of this earth. You see, we forget. We forget the second part. We forget the second part. We forget John the Baptist, who was a man crying out in the wilderness. He was pretty exciting. He had a great ministry. had disciples of his own. Had a following. He would say edgy things. He'd eat locusts. And people were like, that's exciting. And then when he met Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John the Baptist watched his ministry fade as he went to prison, as his disciples left him and went to Jesus. And as he rotted in prison, he learned this truth. Jesus must increase. I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. And as his head was chopped off, he died in faith with the belief that his failure, his results, what he was going through was not as important as what God was doing, as how God was working. And so this, this is the faith of all those people we've talked about. Ezekiel, John the Baptist, right? This is the faith of all those who come in Scripture. It says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. And they had been thinking of the country, had they been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. So as the prophets lived, as they went on, Ezekiel lived the rest of his life with dry bones. And when he died and he got to heaven, he didn't say, God, what happened? It says, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. So he's prepared a city for them. You see, I say, thank God I'm failing because the jobs I'm called to are way too important to only cling to success. In parenting, there's a lot of failure. Out there in the world, the jobs you're called to, the things you have to do, you will be met with failure. And only Jesus is perfect. So these jobs are too important to stop at failure. They're too important to, to draw back. And it says, God is not ashamed to be called our God because our God never fails. Our God never loses. He's not ashamed to be called our God. So what I encourage you guys to do is to start things. Start things. Get out there. Don't focus on results. Because God is not calling these prophets. And he's not calling you to walk in success. He's calling you to walk in obedience. He's not promising you that nothing will go wrong. In fact, if you dive into the Bible, he promises a lot of stuff will go wrong. He says, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. He's encouraging you to walk in obedience, in faith, in trust. Trust that you'll succeed. Trust that you'll always have prosperity. Nothing will go wrong. No, no. To trust that what he has is better. That what he's called you to, he called you to for a purpose and a reason. And it's too important to stop when it looks like failure. Hear the change there when it looks like failure, what's your criteria for success? As for me in my life, I've learned my success is on whether I listen to God or not, and whether I was obedient to God, not how things turned out. So students, start a school devotion. 
Start a school Bible study. You might think that's crazy. I'll invite people. They won't come. We might meet once and it'll fall apart. I've seen students do it. They're like, we're doing this. Pastor Bryce is great. And I was like, they did it for like two weeks. And they're like, we were so foolish to think we could keep this up. No one came. It fell apart. How much was the word of God spread at your school? How much did you stand up for what you believe in, that you were authentic and genuine in your faith? You let it cost you something. So don't say, ah, it didn't work out. I was a fool. Trust God to use it. Parents, start a family devotion. We've done it before, a lot of us, and it didn't last very long. You're like, it lasted once or twice. The baby's crying. We're trying to read the word of God. Do it anyways. And don't say, what was I thinking? How, of course we can't keep this up. Life is too busy. Because if you bring the word of God to your family once, once, I promise you the word of God is living and breathing sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces bone and marrow. It does not return out of the mouth. It does not go out of the mouth and return void. It accomplishes that which it seeks. So start a family devotion. Let it fail. It's okay. God's in it. God's using it. For everyone else out there, invite your neighbor to church. I get it. You're knocking on the door. They're like, we don't want to buy anything. You're like, no, it's just... It's free salvation. He's there. It's free gift. No, no, thank you. You're going to turn. Your face is going to be red. You're like, an idiot. What was I thinking? But how much will God soften hearts? How much will God use that? Ask for forgiveness from those who won't grant acceptance of your, uh, who, who won't send it back to you. Extend forgiveness for those who won't accept it. Because how much will God soften hearts? Follow God, not results. Follow God, not results. So you think I'm the student director here because I have everything figured out? I think my wife is the children's director here because we got it all figured out? No. We don't. But will you serve with us? Will you try things with us? Will you come to feed my starving children? Will you get involved in a growth group? Will you do some of the things around this church and just believe that there's life in it? And maybe you do it once, it doesn't work out. Maybe you just color one picture with one kid, lead one Bible study with a kid, and you're like, ah, that's really not for me. How much will God use you? Because God always gets a return. On your investment. God never fails. God never loses. So I say, thank God I'm failing. Thank God I'm failing. Because it means I'm not resting in comfort. It means I'm not chasing success. God has so much for you. Don't be afraid of failure. Let's pray. Thank you, God.